Hello and welcome to The Book Refuge and welcome to a special video today. So I don't usually make like individual book reviews anymore or series reviews. I just do those for Outlander mostly or a few things here and there. And I found a book which is the first in a series which I just think that you need to check out if you like fantasy and romance which are two genres that I adore. And plenty of fantasies have a little bit of romance in them, right? But not too many of them are actually called fantasy romance or romantic fantasy. And that is why this book is such a treat to me. And that is A Heart of Blood and Ashes by Milla Vane. And this is the first book in A Gathering of Dragons. And I first saw this book like the week that it came out and I purchased it for the cover and title alone because it was in the romance section at Barnes and Noble and I was just hooked. It has kind of like a Game of Thrones vibe going on as well as it was still in the romance section and I was so excited. So I purchased it and it took me a little while to read it, obviously, it's May now, um, but what really pushed me into it actually is that, number one, I heard Sarah and Jen talking about it on the Faded Mates podcast, which if you're a romance lover and you haven't checked out that podcast, you really should. It's Sarah McLean who writes historical romance as well as Jen, I can't remember her last name, but she is a like romance reviewer and blogger and they just have like the best <laughs> reviews for things and they it's just so much fun listening to them talk about romance and they interview other authors and it's really fun so this book i wanted to read even more when i heard what they had to say about it um so what i'm planning to do is i also got an e-arc of the second book which is called a touch of stone and snow and that's what finally pushed me over the edge because I wanted to be able to kind of like binge a couple of the books in the series. And so this second one, because I got an arc for it, it comes out in July. So it's a little ways away from now. But I definitely want to reread this series like each time a new one comes out. Because I'm going to explain things to you in a non-spoilery way first. And then because I haven't seen a ton of people talk about this, I'm going to go into some spoilers. Because number one, I have to gush about it. And none of my other like romance crew has really finished it yet. A couple of them are like in the middle of it. But I just need to gush about some things because this book just hits so many of my like happy lights in my brain that I almost can't stand it. So what is this book about and why do I love it so much? This book is a hate to love romance. It's a I don't want to call it a marriage of convenience because it's definitely very inconvenient for both of them, but it is a strategic alliance between these two people. And that is Matic, who is a commander of the Parsathian like armies, as well as Evine. I'm going to call her Evine. I have no idea how this is pronounced. There are no guides how to pronounce names or anything in this book, which is kind of frustrating but I understand why because it is still in the romance section so it doesn't get treated the same way as a normal fantasy which is something I'll talk about in my cons list when I get there because yes there are a couple cons for this um but the way that we meet this world is Commander Maddock has been out um raiding and fighting in battles and he gets a messenger that his parents have died now the king and queen in this land that ran is what like king means so his father and mother are like Ran Asha and Ran, I can't remember his dad's name right now. They have been killed. And so he is summoned home <clears throat> to meet with the Great Alliance, which has members of all the different like kingdoms who like keep peace and um, make sure that everything, you know, that there aren't any unnecessary wars because when you're dealing with these barbarian clans, you know, you don't want to be turning against your friends because they're easily like angered and stuff like that. So the setup of this is he comes home and the Great Alliance tells him that his parents had went to visit the court of Sicia and his father attacked and raped a woman there 
And so as punishment, they killed him. And then they were going to let his mother go, but she killed one of his sons who killed her husband and then they had to kill her too. That's the story that Ran is told, uh, or I mean that Maddock, Maddock is told. And he just doesn't believe that at all because he knows his parents are honorable and that they would have just never done that. He doesn't know why they were there in the first place. And so it's just a big mess. So, but the Great Alliance tells him that he cannot go pick a fight with them because his father raped a woman there and they have a right to do that. And then his mother killed someone and they have a right to kill them. So basically he's not supposed to do anything about it or it will prevent him from becoming the king of his land. Because the thing is, is that he's not necessarily a prince um, besides being like the son of a king and queen, like he is a prince, but the uh, Parsathans, they vote on who their king will be. Um, which not all the barbarian clans do that. So if he messes things up, like the Great Alliance won't back him to be king. So he's super angry. He's planning to go fight them anyway. So he leaves to do this. This is also the setup, everyone. Sorry. You know me. I ramble. You're used to it. You're fine. You saw how long this video was and you're still here. It's cool. I promise I'll warn you when we go to the spoiler part of this. So Ran is on his way and then a messenger from Sistia shows up and explains that the king of Sistia actually has a secret daughter. No one knows about this princess. No one knows about her. And she's actually a secret daughter of the king. And they he's not allowed to attack the king or his sons. But if he wants revenge for his parents, he could attack the daughter. Who's actually being moved to go be married to this guy in another country. Or in another part of the land. And so... Um, he like takes the advice of this servant and is like, yes, I'll get revenge. I'm going to go get this woman. I'm going to kill her and I'm going to skin her and I'm going to take her back and throw him at this guy's feet. And that's going to be my revenge because I can't kill him. So Maddox listens and he goes and he finds the, um, small caravan that is, well, not even a caravan. It's like one, a small group of people who are transporting this princess. And so it turns out that it's one of the king's sons and then the daughter and then like a couple other guys are guarding um, this daughter who is Evin. Now Maddox demands her and what we come to know about this princess is that actually in this country the line of a goddess goes through the daughters and this daughter she has been locked in a tower all this time hidden away because her daughters will be like the next in line so the king doesn't want her you know being taken by anyone else and being used for the power that she has because she could actually take his throne away based on like her being the true heir's daughter so anyway so she gets brought to Maddox, brought out and it's this sickly kind of looking woman she's really skinny she's not well fed she is super pale and like sallow looking and she just looks like a hot mess and so the <clears throat> the brother who's with her says all these derogatory things about her and he just keeps like you know you don't really want her she's not worth it she's not beautiful um I know you want to have kids on her and Maddox kind of like what no I'm just going to kill her I'm not here to like rape her or do any of the things that you guys did to my family I'm going to do this and then the brother let slip that it's actually Evine who lured Maddox's parents there and he starts saying all this and then Evine stabs her brother in the back she's able to get his dagger while he's ranting about like what a horrible person she is <laughs> and she stabs him in the back and kills him and then Evin looks to Maddox who Maddox walks over and the <laughs> the Parsathan people they like wear these like claws on top of their hands from like the beast that they've killed and so he literally is holding this up to her throat and he says like did you really lure my parents there and she says yes and he's about to kill her and she explains you need to marry me that's why I lured your parents there. I was ex I wanted them to rescue me from my father, and I thought that if we could arrange a um, 
betrothal between you and I that I would be able to escape my father. And Maddox doesn't believe this. And she starts saying, your parents approved of me. This, you know, my father found out what I did and he killed your father. And then, you know, your mother, his, so his mother was raped and tortured by both her father and brothers before she was finally killed. And, you know, Yveen starts saying like, no, your mother wanted you to do this. And the Parsathan people have a huge thing about lies. Like it is a huge theme throughout both of the books I've read now that if you are a liar, you have no honor. You can't become a leader in their country. Like they won't back anyone who's told like any kind of lie. Like you can't even lie about if you think someone looks pretty or not on a day. Like, so he, number one, tells her like, why would I ever marry you? And so she explains, you know, she explains what I kind of explained where like, she's the true heir. If he were to marry her, he would be the king of Sicia and could oust her father and get rid of her brothers and get revenge on them. And if any child that he had through her would be an heir as well. And so she basically is like selling herself to him and explaining like your mother wanted this. Like we talked about it and he makes a vow here, which this vow is like basically the setup for the rest of the novel. And he says that if she ever speaks about his mother again, he will cut out her tongue because there's no way that his mother was okay with this. But he agrees to marry her and that's the beginning of our story. Obviously this is a major like hate to love so much and we're dealing with the barbarians so there's some pretty intense situations in that there are lots of talk of torture and rape um but there is an like immediate chemistry between these two because this woman even though she has been beaten down locked up her whole life she is not as naive as you would think like she had plans and goals and things that she wants and she's willing to do whatever like it is so intense this first meeting with Maddox. Like it is uncomfortable because we don't know this here. We don't know this man too well yet. We don't know what he'll do. And this is a barbarian story. So like, we don't know how far he's going to go with everything. Like, I don't know. And, but we also don't have any feelings for this, this girl yet. Like we don't know if she's telling the truth. We don't know if this is a trick just because she's weak and seemingly, you know, not powerful, she also did just kill her brother in front of us. So it's not like she's completely helpless. But the thing that's immediately apparent about her is that number one, she has no shame. She has no ego and she is willing to do whatever she needs to do. You know, Maddox, immediately there is like some threats of rape because he says, he's like, you know, I don't need to marry you. I could just get a bastard off of you and it wouldn't matter. And like she explains to him, she's like, I don't need you to be queen. Like I am already in line for the throne. That's why my father was hiding me. You being married to me only helps you, but I need you to help get my revenge because I'm not strong enough. So it's this interesting thing because he thinks he holds all the power, but he doesn't. I mean, he holds the power of like, he physically could kill her. He physically could hurt her. But she holds all the power in like, this is the true heir to this. She is queenly in so many ways. And she really is like giving him a chance because there are other, there are other barbarians and other like leaders that she could choose. But she chooses him. And it's a very like big gamble on her part to choose this man whom his parents died at her family's hands to be her husband. So, all right, that's enough of like explaining the plot and everything. Let me tell you a couple of things that I really loved about it. This is like full fantasy. This book is not the mass market paperback of a romance that you'd be thinking. Like there is a lot of story going on. This book is setting up a whole world, which I'll get more into because I'm going to talk about the next book just a little bit in a minute. But we are setting up a whole world here. This is just as intense as like any other fantasy you've read, except for the romance is 100% and the fantasy is 100%. They both work together to forward 
each other. There isn't one part that's more important than the other. We have magical creatures. We have um, connection with horses. We have companions. We have, there's a couple dogs that are um, hunting companions with one of the warriors and they're amazing. Um, there are evil creatures. There are sorcerers. There is um, the destroyer who's our big bad that we're dealing with. There is zombies called wraiths who can reanimate animals and people and use them as an army. Like this is so many things and it is so, it's such a Game of Thrones vibe, but it's not completely the same darkness level. Like it's still really dark, but it also had like the pacing more of like a, a little bit faster. Like this isn't as slow of a slog as you're going to be dealing with. So, a gathering of dragons. Do we see dragons? We don't fully see a dragon in this one. In fact, for most of the book, I thought the reason it would be called a gathering of dragons is that um, Maddox's group of warriors, his like protection, is called a dragon. So, whatever like a leader, their like um, group of people around them is called a dragon because they have. Like each person who's helping like has a different sense that they are. Like they have the, there's someone who's the teeth. There's someone who's the fangs. There's someone who is the wings and the tail. And that is like the job that they have to protect the head who is their leader. So for most of this book, I thought the reason it would be called a gathering of dragons is because um, we're trying to like bring people together uh to defeat the destroyer, which is what the overarching plan of this series is going to be. So enough of the non-spoilers here. I hope I've convinced you to give this a try, especially if you love fantasy and romance, especially if you do love Game of Thrones, if you like Barbarian. Um, there are trigger warnings, like I said. You can check out my good, uh, oh, I guess it's not on my Goodreads. There is, like I said, talk of rape and torture and also just really brutal battle scenes like there is. A lot and there's also the death of an animal in here that was I was not prepared for it and it hurt me a lot um, but I loved this book so much and I highly recommend it now I'm going to talk about spoilers for just a little bit here because I said I need to rant about some things so if you're done thank you so much for watching bye bye um, I'll see you after you have read this and come come visit me we'll talk Okay, so first thing I want to talk about is the first meeting before Evine and Maddox. And the, <laughs> just how Evine, like everything he threatens her with, she just like shrugs, you know, because he's like, I could just rape you. I could just do this. And she's like, you won't have to rape me. Like literally anytime I'm here. I'm here to be your wife. I'm here to be whatever you need. As long as you will help me, you will always find me willing. You will always find me ready. You're never going to be raping me, basically, is what she says. And then proceeds to give him a hand job with her brother's blood on her hands. And it is the most disturbing yet arousing scene I have ever read. And so this is actually the scene that I heard Jen and Sarah talking about on the podcast that I was like, holy shit, what's this book going to be about? Because I need to see it and see how that could be sexy. And oh my God, is it sexy? And it's also this really crazy scene because Evine is a virgin. She's been locked in a tower all this time. And so she's completely willing to do anything he wants, but she doesn't know how. So she's literally like, just tell me what to do. I'm here. Because this girl wants vengeance so badly and needs her father to pay so badly that she just has no ego left. Like she will do whatever it takes to convince him. She will be whoever he needs her to be to do it. And it's just amazing to watch because part of the thing is like he just can't stay mad at someone who's so willing to try and so willing to go. And that's one of the things that like quickly changes is he just wants to like take out all his vengeance on this girl um, because he's so angry and she's admitted that she's the reason his parents went there. But she just, she just like he can't do it because she's so willing to take anything that and like his culture like they respect their women like their queen his mother was just as important as the king and so his men like see how he's treating her 
when she's just so willing and they like kind of shun him a little bit. So that's a big part of the story too is that like community is so important. So if you've done something to kind of piss the group off, if you've kind of been a jerk, they will like for a day of riding just like not talk to you for like 8, 12 hours and that's kind of like your punishment is you're like left out of community. And that was really like kind of touching to see too because there's a few times where like when Maddox is cruel to her for no reason or they think that she's upset that they will like shun him a little bit because they're like you're not being good to her um okay and then also let's talk about the vow since this is a spoiler so that stupid vow that he gives that he'll cut out her tongue and then like a later on um because the fact that his mother like was with Evian for three months they were together in her tower while she was constantly like his father and brother, her father and brothers would like come in and rape her and torture her and just try to like get information out of her. And Maddox's mother like taught her how to use a bow and arrow, um, told her about her son, that she thought her son would be a good match for her. And it was so like beautiful, but Evian knows like Maddox doesn't want to hear it. He's not ready to hear it. He doesn't see her as a trustworthy person, so he can't believe the thing she's saying about his mother. And there's this one piece of the story that it was like the most frustrating but yet thrilling part of it is that when a person, when the queen approved Yvine, she gave her her ring. Um, and Yvine was supposed to show this to Maddox to prove that his mother approved of her. But for most of the story, like, that's not going to be a smart move on her part because she will think, or he will think that Evine took it from his mother and that there's no way that she would have freely given it to her. So Evine has this ring the entire time. And when we get to deeper in their relationship and he started to love her and believe her and wants to be with her, Evine still holds to this truth that his mother approved of her. And they finally get to the point where he res rescinds his vow, but she says, like, I don't want to be with you anymore because you think I'm a liar. And he says, he's like, but Yvine, I believe my mother would have approved of you if she'd known you better. Like, I will forgive you. Like, why do you have to hold to this lie that she approved of you? Like, I love you. It's done. And she just is, like, so heartbroken that he would think she would lie about something so serious. So he tells her, he's like, I'm not done. We're going to figure this out. And she's like... I don't want you to come back. And he says, he's like, okay, you can tell me, you can talk to me about my mom now. I rescind my vow that I will hurt you if you talk about my mother. And so he's like, when I return from this fight, because he's about to go fight the big bad, he's like, we'll talk about it and I'll hear everything you have to say and I promise I won't be upset. And so he's leaving. And just as he's leaving, because Evian doesn't know what this ring means. She just knows that the mother gave it to her as like a symbol of like her trust, but she doesn't know that it is the approval of the queen for this woman to marry her son. And so Evian just thinks it's a trinket from his mother that could mean something to him. So after he's already accepted her and said, it doesn't matter to me, like, I don't care. She comes out and she runs up to him. She's like, wait, don't leave yet. And he's like, I have to go. And she's like, now that I can speak of your mother, let me give you this. She gave this to me before she died, but I knew you wouldn't accept it before then. Um, but now I want to give it to you. Um, you can wear it into battle. And he sees the ring, which his mother resized already so that it will fit Evine. He knows. And he's known she's had it the whole time. But she's been too afraid to give it to him because he would think she was a liar. And it's this beautiful, it's so beautifully done because... Mila Vane like doesn't bring things up too many times so like we know that Evine has the ring because she mentions it in her POV and then like a hundred pages later Maddox is speaking to one of his men and he's like yeah she says my mom approved of her but my mom would have given her her ring so I think she's lying but I love her and I know she's afraid of me you know so he is a good guy. He just is like, you have to be lying about this because otherwise you would have this ring. And so for then a hundred more pages later, for her to give it to him as like, she's giving him this thing from his mother. He just looks at it and he's like, 
oh my god you're telling the truth like I'm so sorry that I almost ruined this because I didn't believe you and it is the sweetest moment it's so it's such sweet victory because Mila made us wait for that but also it was the perfect time because if it had come at any other time he would have reacted badly like we the viewers know that because we've seen him react badly time and time again we've seen him not believe her time and time again and it's perfect it's perfect so I totally totally love this book there are so many things it is brutal like but this oh my god the sex is so good these people are so good so okay now I want to talk a little bit about the sequel but just to explain how it fits in so this book takes place and right so at the end of it or kind of like part way through it um Yveen speaks with the goddess. So in this series, we do talk with the goddess Vila, who Yveen is a descendant of her. And Vila tells her that the destroyer will be in the land within five years. And he's going to destroy everything. And Vila tells Yveen that she needs to unite the five clans against him and create an alliance where they can take him down. Because if they all fight together with their combined powers and things like that, they'll be able to defeat him. Because there are many different, like I said, this is heavily magical. There's a lot of crazy things happening. And so this book um, takes place. And then two years later is when a touch of stone and snow is taking place. And there's not a ton of crossover. Well, I mean, there is because two of Maddox's dragon, so remember that's his guard, they get sent with one of, with Evine's youngest brother, who isn't as, wasn't evil like the rest of the family because he was actually raised with Evine and her mother for a while. And so... He is pretty young though, and he is learning his full powers and is on a diplomatic mission. And so these people are sent with him, but he's not even our main character. He's traveling with a guy named Arax, who is the bastard son of one of the other five, you know, countries that I was talking about. And his love interest, this is a second chance romance in a romantic fantasy <laughs> of his lost love who he had to send away 10 years ago to protect her and this is about them like figuring out their task and then um Evine's brother is like recruiting them to be a part of this alliance that she's supposed to be putting together so we're two more years in the future into her trying to unite everyone and so we're kind of solving the problems of one of the kingdoms so that we can bring them together. And then the third one, which will be out in December, is about one of the people we meet in that one and like her love story. So I'm not going to talk too much more about A Touch of Stone and Snow just because that one isn't even out yet. But I just think that this series is going to be so good. And that's right. I said I talk about the cons. So the only cons that I really had, because I don't mind angry barbarian sex and I don't mind a little bit of violence and like stuff like that. Like as long as the characters work it out in the end, like I don't really mind. You should know that if you've seen my other videos. But the biggest problem I have with this is that it's not treated fully like a fantasy by its publisher. This book needs a map. It 100% needs a map. There is constant traveling in both books. There is description of the five different worlds and like islands and I just cannot map it in my head. I need a map. Also, we could use a list of the names of the five countries and the names of the characters and how to pronounce them. So honestly, that is my main con with this series is that it needs to be treated more like a fantasy than it is. And I need a map and I need like a list of the gods and goddesses there's a ton of those mentioned so that really was my only con is that it made the reading experience hard in the beginning because I wasn't able to look at a map of where we were or like how everyone's related to each other like I wish there had been like Rand Merrick and then his dragon and like listed the names of the people in his dragon and then like Evine and like her father and the names of all her brothers like that would have been so helpful but at the end of the day I can live without that. This book was so good. I read this book in one whole day and I read the sequel in the next whole day and I can't wait for the third one. 
Like, you need to get on this series. I'm just telling you, you're going to want to read this and reread this because there's a lot of information in it. And the fact that all of this goodness is trapped in a mass market paperback, I just don't know what to do. So thank you so much for watching this video. Let me know if you've read it. Talk to me about the spoilers, the things you liked. I didn't want this review to end up being an hour long as a video to convince people to read something. So, but I have a lot of feelings because Evine, she is on my book girlfriend list now because I've been, man, I've seen very few female characters who had so much stacked against them and had such a spine of steel, but also like no ego. Like I said, this woman is willing to do whatever she has to for her people because her father is treating them poorly. And she needs to take control of her country and take care of her people. And it's so good. So thank you so much for watching this. If you made it all the way to the end, let us chat about this amazing barbarian romance because it's amazing. So thank you so much for watching. I put up three to four videos a week and you can watch some more of them right now. Bye.